back those who love him so much. And he and his family are part of our family here at Otter Creek Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Wayne Butler, for those of you who don't know me, pastor here at Otter Creek. And we welcome you here to this celebration of a special life, a special man. A husband, a son, a dad, a brother, a family member, and a friend, close acquaintance to one of many people here today. It's so appropriate, so special. That so many of you testify to the specialness of his life, the special person that he is by being here this morning to honor him and to comfort his family. And we thank you for that. May God bless you so richly as we celebrate his life. And his life is not ended, but his life continues on because a person who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ does not die. But they leave this temporary tent that the Apostle Paul used to speak of a tent. It's being the body, the tent. And this tent dies. It gives up one day and we leave this old tent and we go on to be with the Lord. And this is just like the old lava stage that we all know about. Soon it becomes a beautiful butterfly. Up in glory with our Heavenly Father where we'll be those who are saved by faith in Jesus Christ will be for all eternity. And so we celebrate his life this morning and we offer our comfort and our love and our friendship to his family and pray for them and their peace that passes all understanding through the love of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you if you would at this time to stand with me and join with me in prayer. If you would. Our precious Heavenly Father, we must say thank you this morning for your love. We thank you for the peace that we feel, the specialness of celebrating the life of Brother DeWitt, knowing that he's with you now and I know that he's in good hands. We pray your peace upon his family, upon his wife, upon his mother, his, his children, his loved ones. All those friends who are here today, Lord, we pray your peace upon them. And we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be here together with them. Father, we ask that you bless us this morning. Bless little Billy as he brings the message. All those who participate in the service this morning, Lord, that whatever we do today will be done in such a great way to the bless the family and bring honor and glory to your name. We praise you for salvation through your son, Jesus. We praise you for being there with us every day. Help us, Lord, as we serve you, to be there for each other every day, loving and caring and nurturing one another, for that's what the family of God does. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. On all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. God bless you. The Word of God says in Revelation 14, 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, write Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And Brother D. Witt went through a hard haul last year or so. But he finished up, finished strong, and uh, he's with our Lord Jesus Christ now. And as Brother Wayne said, you know, those of you that know Christ, you'll get to see him again. And those of you that love him, if you want to see him again and you don't know Christ, you need to get to know Christ so that you can see him again. Because we will be raised just like Jesus was raised, just like he raised Lazarus, and just like he promised to raise each and every one of us that trusted him as our Savior and Lord. Because Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. You know, he that believeth in me, though he, he is dead, yet shall he live. So I believe that, and I know he went firmly believe that. 
But DeWitt Talmadge Watson III was born uh, January the 25th of 1955 in Williston. And he was the son of DeWitt T. Watson Jr. and Miss Eunice Watson. And he went to be with our Lord January the 7th from Chiefland. DeWitt was a lifelong resident uh, here in Levy County. He retired after a long career with the state of Florida Forestry Service. All of his comrades in the forestry, if you'll stand for us, so we can honor you today. All of the buddies that he worked with. Let's see where all of his workers, what fellow workers. Thank you guys for serving with him. Thank you for, for his long service. He enjoyed being in the woods, hunting, or in a boat fishing. He enjoyed the genealogy and was a member of the Sons of the Confederate Veterans. But more than anything else, he loved spending time with family and friends and being papa to his grandchildren and Uncle Deep to his nieces and his nephews. In fact, we're, we're actually kin now. We found out, we thought we were only kin by marriage, and now we found out we're kin in another way. Because Miss Frances, uh, her ancestors from Scotland, come out of our same family line of Keith. So we're, we're kin on both ends, on, by blood on one side and marriage on the other. But one thing about Levy County, don't talk about anybody because you're <laughs> probably kin to it. But I tell you what, it's wonderful to be a part of a great big family. And, and I know that each and every one of you love the Watsons like we do. <coughs> it meant a lot to our lives. But uh, he leaves uh, behind as he heads on to heaven and spending time there with his, his father and others that have gone on before us. He uh, leaves his wife, Frances, behind and his son and daughter-in-law, Jeremy, Nina Watson. A son and daughter-in-law, Kyle and Angela Watson. His mother, Miss Eunice. Uh, sister and brother-in-law, Sheila and Brian Crawford, and his grandchildren, Travis, Savannah, Chatelain, Madeline, Levi, and Elena. Nieces and nephews, Celeste Crawford, Lachey, and Brandon uh, Mac McMickle. Did I say that right? I, I, I didn't pronounce it right. We got it. Joel Crawford, Jonathan Crawford, and Brian Cornell. And uh, he was preceded in death by his father, he went to Watson Jr. in 2002, and many other family and friends. And as, as uh, Brother Wayne said, you might call him a lot of things, but if you knew him very long and were close to him, you'd call him a friend. And uh, I, love, I love that man. And I know you do too, and thank you for being here today. At this time, Lauren and Jason are going to come sing a song for him. Please don't cry, I've had a good life, but I'm tired now, and I'm ready for you to go, and I'll be waiting up there to go real, real me again, and I know. It's only my time here that's over If life's like a blink of an eye And I've opened my heart to the Savior So don't worry, I'm gonna be alright I'll be with the Lord tonight. Well, I won't be mine. I'll never break it down. Be ready to tell you goodbye. Here I am now. About to be. It's only joy that I cry when I look out to see you tomorrow these old eyes won't stand in my way and I know that it's bringing you sorrow and if I could well, I still Don't cry Cause I'm finally on my way 
Good morning. I'm Frank Lawrence, and I'm Dewitt's cousin on my dad's side. And as some of you know, I've written some stories about the family over the years. It's hard to follow, folks. <laughs> so when Dewitt and Francis sat down a few weeks back to make some plans for today, Dewitt said to Francis that he wanted to ask me if I might write something for him that we could share today. I say, what? <laughs> she said he wanted to talk to me face to face about it so he could give me some idea of what he was thinking about. Well, when I was down at camp, he was too sick to come out. And when he was out there, I wasn't there. So we never had that conversation. And when Francis mentioned to it, mentioned it to me Friday night, or Saturday night, I said I'd think about it, but without knowing what was on his mind, gave me a little to go on, and quite honestly, it stressed me out quite a bit. And on the way back to Tallahassee Sunday, which was the last visit that I had with him, I had a chance to think about it. And I thought, just what guidance would he would give me? Uh, and saying in his own way, which is teasing <coughs> and playful in times, his last goodbyes to all of us. And I just kind of relaxed and uh, pictured him up here today addressing you. And I just listened to what I heard him say. And I went home and, and wrote it down. And I've just given it the title of, Is There One Among You? My, you're a sad looking bunch today. <laughs> you know, I really don't approve. I'd rather see some happiness on the faces that I love. <clears throat> Is there one among you? Who can show me a smile today about some silly something we did along the way? Surely there's a memory of the time we had to share that can fill that empty feeling you have because I'm not here. Not to worry though, if you weren't there in time. To say goodbye, I figured you were catching dogs to the middle of the night. And what's the deal with some of the fancy duds? <laughs> I was expecting mossy oak. <laughs> or snake boots and a booty cap. And you guys sure missed the fashion boat. Hey, if you hear somebody calling me, one of those crappy little radios, how about it there, brown gravy? Would you kindly let them know? <coughs> brown gravy's off the radio. But he still can hear your call. Just listen for him to answer back to the hoot elves in the fall. I uh, see you're starting to fidget a bit. So it's time I wrap this up. Now, if you hurry now, you'll still have time to jump that big old butt. <laughs> Goodbye, good friends. And my eternal love to each in my front rows. 
I'm off to the happy hunting grounds. And it's time you let me go. The family has invited anyone who has anything to share at this point to uh, please raise your hand or stand up and the sound guy will come uh, with a microphone <laughs> to let you share your own thoughts or stories about uh, be with. So I invite you to do that now. Is there anyone who would want to try to take that on? I know you didn't expect that. It's something that um, hardly any of us can do on the spur of the moment. But we wanted to invite you to in case you had something <coughs> that you might want to share. Thank you very much. song that David actually requested us do so much. Well, actually, there was more, but my wife wouldn't let me do that. <laughs>
I'm going to be so honest with you, there's been a lot of hard days in my life, but when he would ask me to do this, I could have thought of a hundred other things I'd rather do. But what do you tell a man who asks you to do something like this? Only that, yeah, I'll do it. You know, and I've never faced anything like this. In the time I've been doing ministry work so far, you know, this is pretty personal now. You know, it hits pretty close to home as it does for a lot of you. You know, if there's any way out of it, I would have talked my way out of it or bought my way out of it for sure, but there wasn't because I give the man my word. So, you know, I kind of feel like Captain Woodrow F. Call in the movie Lonesome Dove when he said, from now on, I guess I'm going to have to be careful with the promises I make a man. You know, because I never thought when Dee would ask me to do this, I'd have to fulfill that promise so soon. You know, none of us did. You know, of all the things he's been through in life and all the things he's done, I never thought it would make in like this. You know, I always thought maybe he'd go out and blow the glory somewhere on fire or on the mullet boat or something like that. But you know, you never know what kind of hand life's going to do. You never know how it's going to end. You know, we don't know that. The truth is that none of us are really prepared for days like this. And as hard as it is for me, I know it's even harder for you guys because we lost one heck of a son. And like they said, a brother, a husband, a father, a grandfather, an uncle, and a friend. And as you look around the crowd today, there ain't no doubt in my mind there's a lot of people that love me. And to me, that is the greatest testimony of a man of who he is. Is at the end of his life, there's a crowd that's gathered. It ain't about what you can accumulate in life. It ain't about what you can grab hold to and hang on to and have. It's about the effect you leave in people's lives. It's about the impact you leave. I know he's impacted each and one, every one of your lives. You know, over the past few days, we've had a chance to kind of reminisce over some favorite stories. We've been looking at pictures, trying to find some that would work here on them boards, and we told fishing stories and hunting stories, and we was at Miss Francis's, and they were looking through pictures and grabbing deer horns and stuff to try to make an arrangement of flowers with some deer horns, and they were talking about the deer that killed. And just a lot of reminiscing going on, a lot of memories. A lot of pictures, you know, favorite stories, lessons learned, a lot of things he left behind. And that's something that what happened to him as far as death that can't be taken from us. We still got that. We can still go on with that. We can remember him as long as we live, you know, through those what he left behind. But today I can only share with you the effect he had on my life. I can't speak for anyone else. So if you allow me to do that, I can do that for a few minutes and just tell you what he meant to me. You know, I've known him for 20-something years, known his family a little longer than that. But I really didn't get to know DeWitt until I went to work for the Division of Forestry going on 17 years ago. And he was the senior ranger at the time at Usher Work Center, and, and Richard was out during that time. He was the boss there, Richard Eastman, but DeWitt was kind of filling his role and senior ranger. And, you know, over those first few days and weeks and months in that first year, I really got to know him. I really got to be friends with him. Him and Ben both worked with him by just about every day. You know, and through those first few months in that year, I learned a lot about the fire from him. You know, when he was with me on my first fires, he, he was always out there somewhere, him or Ben, you know, and he taught me a lot about fire and fire behavior and weather and weather patterns and, and, and swamps and the terrain we have in this county and sea breezes, a lot more I learned from any book I ever studied. I'd already knew it most of the time I went to school to learn what they had. You know, and I always thought that the state of Florida could save a whole lot of money and just let us new guys hang out with the old guys like Richard and be with them. You know, because they taught me a whole lot more about this business than I ever learned anywhere else. You know, that's just some things I took from him at work. You know, after he had his burn over that time and spent some time in the hospital and many other close calls, you know, it never stopped him from getting on a tractor and being on the fire with us and going with us. He still loved to do it. He still, if he ever got a chance and you'd let him, he'd get on your tractor and go. You know, that's just the way he was. It, you know, in some of the stickier situations and chasing fire and swamps, he taught me that slower sometimes is always better. That sometimes you just got to idle that thing down and creep out or creep on through it. And he didn't mean just 
Campfires. He meant in life as well. Sometimes you just look down and out of things down and ease your way through. You know, he'd always say, just calm down. Don't lose your head. Think about your situation. Think about your surroundings and let your conscience be your guide. How many ever heard that? Let your conscience be your guide. You look around and a lot of them that heard that from you. You know, he taught us to joke around. Some of us didn't need teaching, but he taught us how to do that. He taught us how to cut up and have fun, which was most of the time. Well, it was kind of all the time. Except when there was work to do. And when there was work to do, he expected us to work until the job was done. And if it got to whipping our rear ends too bad, he didn't mind regrouping, trying something new, taking advice from somebody else. And it may take a few more tractors, a few more men, a few more hours, a few more late nights, but if there was a way to get it done, we'd figure it out. And we weren't going to give up until we stopped it because we was leading county. And there was very few times we had to call on anybody else because of that determination we had that he gave us. During fire season, there was a lot of hard days and weeks out of the year. So he taught me never to stand when you could sit. Never sit when you could lay down. Because you never knew when you had to be up for days and hours on end working a fire. So I took that serious. I mean, I'm all about getting a nap. You can ask anybody. And one day I was down at Lebanon Station and it was, we'd had lunch. I was by myself. I was partnered with Bob. He wasn't there that day. And I'd had lunch and I got in there and, and I'm going to tell on him, but it's okay because he can't defend himself. Right now. But uh, I put in a movie. It was once and love, I think, at the time. I sat back on the couch, and I started sitting up, and as I got into the movie, I got to where I was laying down and fell asleep. And you ever get that feeling when somebody's kind of watching you, or somebody may be there? And I felt that, you know, we was good about composing ourselves real quick, shutting off the TV and wiping the droop <coughs> off the face, and trying to get the red ball off. And I did all that. And then I looked over, and he was sitting at the end of the couch. And he said, boy, I didn't think he was ever going to wake up. I've watched three hours of this movie. <laughs> and it was time to go home. <laughs> but that's the way he was, you know. He understood. He'd been there. He'd been where we was, you know. And he knew we didn't need to be sleeping. We weren't supposed to be sleeping, watching movies or anything like that. You know. And he knew we knew it, so he didn't have to say a whole lot about it. You know, he knew, we knew we was in trouble. But he never come down on us real hard about stuff like that. And there's no doubt d has left his mark in your lives as well as mine and some tracks to follow. He taught me how to be a leader, which comes in pretty handy now. He taught me how to be a boss without being bossy. How to treat people fairly. How to give people first, second, and even third and fourth and fifth chances as he did me and Bob a lot of times. You know, I can think of a time when me and Bob had watched another movie we weren't supposed to be watching. It was when Pearl Harbor come out. And me and Bob got the idea. There was a part in the movie where they were fighting the Japanese, the two guys, and, the, and they were doing it in Hawaiian shirts. They were flying and fighting the Japanese, the air to air combat in their Hawaiian shirts. So me and Bob got the idea, hey, let's just have a Hawaiian shirt Friday. That looks pretty cool. So every Friday we started wearing Hawaiian shirts. I don't know why we're doing it. It's just stupid, I guess. But, you know... The people at Gothi were mad at us because we didn't obey no rules or follow no orders, and here we are in Hawaiian shirts every Friday. And one day we forgot about it. We had our Hawaiian shirts on, and they called us to a fire, and we just jumped the truck and took off. And we actually got the fire got out, and here we are in Hawaiian shirts and not our uniform. And we got called into the office and in a very nice way. He said, boys, what in the heck were y'all thinking? He didn't say that. He said, what were y'all thinking? I don't know, we started telling him about the movie. He said, put down the shot about the movie. What were y'all thinking? Y'all are going to get me in trouble. And he said, I don't want to get in trouble. So next time, don't do it in your Hawaiian shirts. Do it in your fire shirts. You know, and as we walked out the door, he said, no more Hawaiian shirt Fridays either. You know, he didn't know about it. He knew, knew what we did. He knew what went on. You know, but that's just how he was. He was a man to give a chance to somebody, a second chance, and a third chance. He was always seen to look for the best in folks. Every day it always seemed that you were working with him and not for him. That's how it seemed. 
What I liked about him also in his rough and tough and smart aleck old forest ranger ways, he had a tender side when it come to kids. He had a tender side when it come to you kids because he talked about you quite often. He was proud of you. He talked about those girls, his girls and them boys and his boys, you know, and, and it just he had a tender spot for kids. I know he kept you hoos and other drinks in his coolers for kids in the woods, you know. He just cared about kids. And I also knew he had a tender spot for his wife, Miss Francis, when she was down, he took care of her. And Miss Eunice taking care of his mama all the time. And anybody else that was in need, he'd lend a hand. He always told me that family comes first no matter what. He always made sure that our family was taken care of. If we had a problem, he wanted us to go to take care of it. He wanted us to go home and, and fix it and, and take care of what needed to be took care of. Family came first with him. You know, it come first so much that I think I heard the other night a story about Kyle when he was little thought that he had brothers all over this county that he didn't know about. <laughs> because, you know, we called me with so one of us call, somebody call, need help, or just want to talk, and Miss Francis always say, deal with one of your other sons is on the line, <laughs> or one of your boys. You know, that's just how it was. His immediate family came first, but also his work family came first, too. He was always there for us guys. He'd give us his, uh, his opinion when asked or when not asked. He'd advise us on some of life's greatest decisions. I confided to him many times over the years. And the last time was when I was being called into the ministry because I didn't know what was going to happen. I knew that I may have to quit this job with the forestry and move on. And I talked with him about that a long time. And he got down to a point where he said, you know what? You got to follow God's lead in your life. The most important thing to me is families, but the first most important thing is what God's calling you to do and what God expects of you. You know, not only was family important, but I found out through the years that his faith played a great role in his life. Because he'd been in some rough spots. He went through some rough things, you know. When he was laying on his back in the burning, I found out later on that when he was at the end of himself, he said, you don't know how much of a man you ain't till they go to scrape it on you. And you find out what you're made of. And when he was at the end of himself, laying on his back, he reached out for something greater than he reached out for greater strength, and that is the time he accepted Christ as his Savior. And he asked him into his life. And he depended on him throughout his life. You know, in Ed's funeral, DeWitt was doing the same thing I'm doing here, speaking at Ed Peters, one of our co-workers that got killed. And DeWitt pulled a Bible out of his back pocket, and he opened up to a passage of Psalms. And I don't know exactly where it was. I wish he did. And he read a scripture, and he said, this is what's brought me comfort when I needed it. This is where I find strength when I need it. And I want to read it to y'all today. So I'm going to do like DeWitt did. I want to read to y'all from John 14, verses 1 through 6 in the Bible. Gospel of John, chapter 14. And this is where Jesus is talking to his disciples. Jesus is fixing to face death. He's fixing to go through some excruciating things, a lot of pain. And he's telling his disciples what's going to happen, what's to come. <coughs> And his disciples, they don't want to hear nothing about it. They don't want no part of it. They, they love Jesus. They walk with Jesus. They believe in Jesus. They left everything behind and followed Jesus. And now, this Jesus said, we love this man we love is going to go. They didn't want to hear it. They were upset about it. They were troubled about it. And Jesus told them in John 14, 1 through 6, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe, so, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And I found three promises in this passage of Scripture that helped me, that have given me strength for today. It's given me a hope and a comfort. I want to pass that on to you. Number one promise that I found in here is there is a peace that's offered. A peace is promised. 
You know, people say, how can you stand up in here and do this? This ain't me doing this. This is God working through me. And you being able to stand this today is because you grabbed hold of Jesus. And you grabbed hold of what he has to offer. And you know the deal that's in a better place and the deal that's with him. And that's what gives you strength. But the words he said is, let not your heart be troubled. Don't worry about it. You know, just take it easy. It's like David used to say, just idle her down take it easy. Don't worry about that. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. You know, we've all lost a friend to a terrible disease. And it's a sad day. But even in the midst of all this, you can find peace. You can find peace knowing that D-Witt is in a better place. That he ain't hurt no more. He ain't suffering no more. He had a long road, you know. And, and how we can do that is because if we have faith, and we believe in God's word and his son Jesus that even in the midst of the worst storms and the worst times of our life we're flat on our back. There's something greater than us that we can reach for. And God promises I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You can rest assured to God even today, right now, at this moment, he's here. He is alive and he is well. And the key to receiving that peace that passes all understanding is putting your faith totally in Him and trusting Him that He's going to do what He said He's going to do. Second promise is the future with Him. Scripture said, He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And guys, He's preparing a place for us. The Bible tells us in six days God created the heavens and the earth, but I don't think anything will compare to what Jesus has been doing for about 2,000 years and what He's prepared for. You know, I don't, I don't think nothing can prepare us for that. You know, and D. he had a great life. He had a great career. He had a great family. Saw a lot of places, did a lot of things. He hunted in Wyoming. We were looking at pictures of that, how beautiful that was. Bird was wanting to move there, you know, the other day. It was so perfect. <coughs> He's seen a lot of great things, but I promise you, nothing compares to what was awaiting him. Nothing compares to it and what he's getting to see and experience now. That verse tells us that in my father's house there are many rooms. There's room for be with. There's room for you. There's a room for me. There's a room for anyone that trusts in Jesus Christ. There's plenty of room there. And that's comforting me to know that God cares that much about us. That he let us be part of his family. That, that's comforting to know that God saw something in us worth saving. That he loved us so much he sent his own son to die for us. That's comforting to know and he's been preparing a place for us. And we can live with him forever. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. That's not only a physical death. But that's a spiritual death. Total separation from God. That's what sin gets us. That's what our life gets us without God. But, there's a but in there. It says but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, Dewey's life may have ended on this earth, but the moment he took his last breath here, he began a new life there. The moment he said his goodbyes here, he said some hellos on the other side. And he's got a new body in a place called heaven. And the Bible says there's going to be no more pain there, no more suffering there, no more sickness there. And he gets to be taking all that, all because of the trust of Jesus Christ is his Savior and accepting what God had to offer. Today, he was at peace with his Savior. Not only does Jesus promise us peace now, but also peace then. He promises a place with him. And the third thing is God didn't leave us hanging, but prepared a way for us to get there. Anyone in the right mind, I would think, wouldn't want to miss heaven. I don't think there's anybody in their right mind that wouldn't want to go there, but the problem is some just don't know the way. They just can't find it. They just can't see it. Many think they have a good idea. They try to do good things. They try to be good to people and be nice to people and, and, and give to charities, obey the Ten Commandments, go to church, dress a certain way, don't cuss, don't drink. I've heard it all. And they think that's going to get them there. They try in their own little way to try to earn their way to heaven. And guys, that ain't how it happens. As good a guy as DeWitt was, no matter how good he was to people, how many he helped in his life, that wouldn't have been good enough to get him to heaven. That's why the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. 
It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's only by God's grace and mercy and love and forgiveness that we ever have a chance at life after we die. The scripture tells us that someone else <coughs> paved the way for us. Someone else paid our entry fees. Someone else paid our debt. And that's where Jesus came in and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. You know, I remember on many fires, DeWitt was always looking out for us. And one thing about him, if he was there with you, if he wasn't busy, busy, busy on the radio or handling a bunch of stuff, he was always out ahead of you. And the thickest part in the woods or a pond or swamp somewhere <laughs> flagging a trail for you. Always. Flagging you a way to go. Guys, we're all going to make this appointment right here. The Bible says all men are going to face it. We're all going to face death. We're all going to have our time. And I, I'm pretty sure that none of us are ready to go right now. But I urge you to plan for that day. I urge you to get ready by knowing for sure if you die today that you end up in heaven. To make sure. Guys, Jesus Christ flagged the way. <coughs> He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He was flagging the way for us to have that assurance. And I don't believe anybody in their right mind would choose the other option. They'd have to be crazy. They'd have to be insane to choose hell over heaven. But many will end up there because they chose not to accept God's son, Jesus. I can still hear D. Wick coming over the radio and saying, hey, hey, he probably said, hey, knucklehead or something like that. You know, or other choice words if you weren't paying attention. But he'd say, hey, you guys, look over here. And he'd be waving a piece of flag through them woods. Or you could see his yellow fire shirt as he moved ahead of you. And he would tell us if we need to change direction or not. He'd tell us, you need to go, quit going the way you're going and come to me. <coughs> come follow me. Quit going the way you've been going and come to me. You know, there was never a time... I can't recall following D-Wig that I didn't ever make it out. He never led me wrong. We always made it home at the end of the day. Every time we were still here. You know, at that point when he said, you need to change the direction you're going to come to me, that was a point in my own life I had to make the choice, do I trust him and put my life in his hands or I just do what I want to do? And most of the time I put my life into his hands and followed his way because the way we were going was leading to that. And guys, if you don't get anything out of this, he's flagging you away today. He asked me to do this because I knew, you know, I tell you the truth. Guys, there's a lot of us that are going the wrong way. There's a lot of us that are going to end up in a bad place. We'll change the direction we're going. I don't recall ever one time following him, he ever let me wrong. And I don't recall ever one time following Jesus Christ as he ever let me down. And he didn't let me wit down because he walked with him all through his life. <coughs> the time he accepted him through this, and he's walking with him now. I'll never leave you no forsake, is what he says. But it would have never happen if he hadn't made the choice to put his life to Jesus. Set me to say. Guys, it's all about what you leave behind. He's left a lot of things behind for us to remember him by. He's left us work experiences, life experiences, things that we've taken with us. And I say that we need to learn from him. We need to learn from the man he was. That's all we got left. And remember the things he taught us. And guys, he flagged us a way to go. And it's your choice now. Do you trust in that way or not? Let's pray. <coughs> Dearly Father, I thank you for this day. Well, I thank you for dealing with it. Thank you for his family. I thank you for the opportunity to stand up here, Lord, and just do what you called me to do. Lord, I pray for somebody here today that doesn't know you as their Savior. They do not know Jesus Christ. They've never accepted 
Today's the day they make that choice to put their lives in his hands. To ask him into his, their heart. To ask him to come in and forgive them. Be the Lord of their life and be their boss. Lord, thank you for saving Dee with you. Lord, thank you for saving me. And all others are trusting in you. Lord, as we leave here from today, Lord, go with us. Comfort us. Give us strength. Give us guidance when we need it. Ask all these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Guys, we're going to close this down here. And we're going to move over to Bronson. We thank you for being here on behalf of the family. And we would enjoy you coming with us over to Bronson to the cemetery. But other than that...